as a part of basic course in technology and bridge emerging pedagogical methods so today's webinar is on transforming the challenges into the opportunities by appropriate use of ICT methods so in because of covid we have seen that how ICT can be used uh, how this challenges challenging period can be converted into opportunity to use the ICT platform and we have seen in our university the two distinguished people who has helped us in doing so is uh, Mr. Rajesh Karkera our deputy director IT and uh, Dr. Ashwini Dutt, our associate dean academics in Nepal Medical College these two people we have seen that how they have used this opportunity and helped each one of us to use this platform uh, in our university. So I welcome you all. Uh, I just wanted to request and also welcome uh, Dr. Rajput from uh, University of Delhi, Ramanuj College, uh, our external resource person. I also welcome Dr. Janardhan Aital for the, the resource person, Dr. Uh, Imran Pasha from Dental College. Uh, one uh, one more good news is that uh, uh, for today we uh, have what, 10 minutes of valedictory program in the end. So that time we uh, I'm happy to announce that our pro vice chancellor Dr. B H Ripati Rao sir will be there with us for the valedictory program. So I request all the participants not to leave till the valedictory program is over. I have seen in the last session people are leaving the group. So please see to it that uh, our pro vice chancellor sir will be there for the, at around 3.30 at, at the end of all the sessions. For 5 to 10 minutes we have experience sharing or any feedback from you and some uh, advice from Dr. B. H. Sripati Rao. So please stay back, don't go. So all the best for today's webinar. Over to Dr. Ashwini Dutt sir. Thanks sir. Good afternoon all. We will start today's webinar. I am happy to introduce Mr. Rajesh Karkera, who is an engineer, graduated in 1989, underwent marine engineering training at Musgaon Docks and joined the Norwegian shipping company as maintenance engineer and worked in cargo and oil takers, migrated to Canada and got his diploma in software technology in Chicago. He worked for US government projects for police and port systems for about 10 years as lead software developer. He moved back to India in 2007 and started working as Deputy Director IT at Tenepai Deputy University. He has global working experience of 29 years in which he worked exclusively 21 years in IT. And he is the lead person who has developed the IT systems very well, whether it's in education or management in our Tenepai Deputy University. We are happy to have you with us, sir, for your opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, respected uh, speakers of the event, uh, coordinators of this session, colleagues, friends, and dear participants. It's a great privilege to stand in front of you. I mean, uh, stand in front of your computer screens and uh, make an opening remark on this webinar, transforming challenges to opportunities by appropriate use of ICT methods. Frankly, I had to read this title of this webinar twice to understand what it really meant. The first thing it says, transforming challenges to opportunities. And secondly, it used the word appropriate use. Friends, this is the key. In the world of technology, there is no shortage of ideas. But unfortunately, we all know that ideas and challenges go hand in hand. Also, there is no shortage of tools in the market. Uh, you may not be aware of this, uh, you know, a number of calls and proposals we received at Yenapoya from IT service providers and vendors to assist us with the online academic activities during this COVID lockdown. But without spending anything extra, we were able to do our online activities, including nearly 170 classes to over 4,000 plus students on daily basis. It's continuing now also, including lectures, tests, 
and even university exams i think we were able to transform the challenges into opportunities to a greater extent and probably did an appropriate use of technology in hand since this gathering is by academicians i would like to bring up university uh, let's say that you know you need a help regarding your finances you will go to a ca or an accountant you need a medical help you will go to a doctor but unfortunately if you need a help with respect to it you have nowhere to go yes being a head of it for yanapoya i am saying this uh, if we take a case of a teacher who wants to accomplish a task using ict tools most probably he is all alone uh, the traditional it in any education institute may not be able to offer much help other than giving you a computer and the internet it all you know your take how you want to accomplish your task you need to know the options available and the best possible implementation to adopt only then you will be able to convert the challenges into opportunities your challenge uh, do not just end here how do you collaborate with a group of students should you use a online classroom or uh, should you uh, and should you use uh, create your own content or something already uh, available uh, uh, freely uh, do you evaluate how do you evaluate the students uh, or uh, manage their assignments online uh, add to that uh, you also have to plan on the safety of your data you have to worry about uh, data theft data loss hacking invasion of privacy uh, th there is no easy out of the box solution available that is why i said it department cannot help you much the only way you will be you will overcome these challenges is by upgrading your it skills and ICT awareness. Today's webinar should definitely help you in achieving that. I would like to congratulate the organizers for coming up with the need of the our topic. And I'm sure topics that are going to be presented today will give a whole new perspective into ICT enabled teaching and learning platforms and the methodologies. Uh, thank you once again for uh, giving me an opportunity to you know uh, initialize this uh, event uh, you all have a very successful day thank you thank you sir for your opening remarks now over to dr neha aswani who is assistant professor in department of microbiology and members chp who will take over from now and who is also coordinated thank you sir uh, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today's webinar, Dr. Nikhil Kumar Rajput, Assistant Professor, Department of Computer Science, Ramanujan College, University of Delhi. Dr. Nikhil has completed his MTech and PhD in Computer Science from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, India. He has represented University of Delhi in West College, Scotland, UK, under the UK India Education Research Initiative project in the year 2015. And also, he was among the 19 delegates selected by TAFI Australia to visit Canberra under the Australia India VELT program 2017. He has, to his credit, several research papers in various international journals and con conferences. He has been invited as a resource person for various training workshops, seminars in eminent institutes like Ames, New Delhi, South Asian University, Mumbai University, Jesus Mary College, TGDAV College, Mata Sundri College, and many more. He has convened and coordinated five national faculty development programs and has acted as advisory and technical committee member for several international conferences. He has also served as a reviewer of several journals and conferences. He has done consultancy work for SBI officers election automation and is presently the principal investigator of a two-star innovation project of University of Delhi. 
He was also the national course coordinator of an MHRD Swayam online course. Recently, he got a major project of about 40 lakhs from Department of Science, uh, Science and Technology India for building a solution for interactive and immersive framework for cultural heritage sites. I can proudly say that I myself have been a part of uh, uh, faculty development MOOCs conducted by Ramanujan College in the month of July for 15 days, which has given me a deeper insight into the use of technology in education. So it, it's a pleasure having you, us with us, uh, having you with us, sir. Over to you. Thank you, Nia, ma'am. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, thank you. Uh, sir, uh, for inviting me, Rajesh, sir, for inviting me, uh, Rajesh, sir, for the introductory remark, and thank you, Ashwini, sir, for uh, having me in this webinar. I I hope my voice is clear because I uh, there's net fluctuation, internet fluctuation there. So please uh, let me know if you if you're not able to hear me uh, at any point of time. Okay, so without wasting uh, any time, let's start with uh, today's topic, and I hope. Uh, uh, I will try to cover as much as things I can cover in this one hour. And uh, I would like that this the session should be interactive. So you can uh, ask any question. Uh, if you have any doubt, any query, then you can ask me any, at any point of time. Uh, so uh, today I'm just going to, I'm uh, not opening my video because of this uh, net is not so good here. So uh, I will share my screen uh, after some time uh, to show you uh, different kind of MOOCs and different type kind of tools available for uh, this uh, uh, online teaching. Uh, let's start with the uh, basic thing. So uh, there are three uh, kind of uh, teaching uh, presently. So there are three broad categories. You can categorize the whole teaching process, especially in this COVID time as a three broad category. So the first is our traditional classroom setting. So in which uh, we go to our classroom, we interact with our student, face-to-face -face interaction is there. Uh, students can ask uh, any question uh, in the classroom. Uh, we use our blackboard or whiteboard for our teaching. So this, this classroom is our traditional classroom setting, which is uh, there from several centuries. Uh, now, uh, there is a concept called we call as blended learning, in which we use online tools along with our traditional classroom okay so blended learning uh, is not completely online it's not completely traditional it it uses uh, the features of both the things so we have our traditional classrooms uh, but we also use some tools to manage uh, certain things and you can say uh, to in uh, to just uh, uh, to, to for for our some part of our teaching uh, it we use online tools you know, for example uh, there is a co tool called google classroom we use it to manage our uh, study material and uh, for uh, just taking some uh, quiz assignments and other things uh, in in this mode so this is this we we can consider as a blended mode we use microsoft teams we are using uh, this uh, uh, google meet uh, all these tools uh, we can use in uh, just uh, with our traditional classroom uh, teaching also so these you can call as a, a blended mode of learning there are say, hundreds of tools available uh, which supports blended uh, learning uh, now comes the third category uh, which is completely online so traditional classroom setting and uh, our a uh, blended which is a mixture of two things and there's a third category which is completely online teaching so which is uh, broadly ca called as MOOC massive open online course so it uh, uh, it it is it got popular in uh, in since the last I say I can say 15 17 years uh, but in India it is gaining popularity after this swim and other things are there uh, but uh, uh, what is the difference between blended mode of learning and uh, MOOC? So MOOC is completely online. So uh, it, it stands for Massive Open Online Course. So it's open, it's online, and it's course. So it's completely course. So for example, we we have our uh, classes like BCom honors or BA honors or BSc honors uh, in our college, or maybe uh, MBBS or. Uh, some BPT or other type of degree courses in our college. Uh, what are the process uh, that are involved in this classroom, uh, in this course thing? Uh, 
uh, student comes uh, he fills the forms uh, he just uh, uh, applies for the course fills the forms uh, gets admission in that course uh, classes he, he or she takes the classes uh, assessments and uh, finally uh, the final exam and after three or four years uh, he or she receives uh, the degree okay so this is mode is a traditional classroom and if uh, we if, if we can convert this whole setting into a online mode then it is then you can co consider it as a mooc so the whole process should be online so a uh, student can come uh, to that uh, online platform uh, fill they can fill the form uh, they can take the admission they can submit the fees if fees is there and uh, they will have to uh, go uh, with uh, go along with the classes that are held and uh, after that uh, what he or she will have to do uh, she will have to complete the assignments uh, take the final exam and uh, finally after completing the course uh, he or she will get the online degree or online certificate for that course so this is a MOOC so you can say it is an extreme end of uh, traditional classroom setting it's completely online and uh, I will uh, share you some uh, platforms which give uh, let me share my screen now uh, I hope my screen is visible yes sir okay so uh, let me start with some uh, popular uh, MOOC platforms, which were very popular uh, in the last, say, 15 years. So the first one was Coursera, which was started by uh, two faculty of uh, Stanford. Andrew NG was one of them, and Stephanie Kohler. You can see now they have established uh, Andrew NG and Stephanie Kohler, 2000. So it was founded in 2012, and it is uh, now one of the biggest uh, MOOC providers. So a student, or even we can also go there. Uh, we will we can register here, and you will find there are hundreds of universities. Uh, they offer course here, uh, including and it is from every field. If you are a medical, if you are in the medical field, you will find hundreds of uh, medical courses in there. So what are, what are their pattern? Uh, most of the courses are free if you don't want certificate. But otherwise, uh, if you want a certificate, then you will have to pay for it. Uh, but anyone can see the content, most of the contents, uh, free of cost. OK, so this was one of the most popular uh, course. So what, what anyone will have to do? Anyone will have to just register for any course? Let me let me find some course. Uh, say I will, I will try to find some course in medical. So say this is anatomy offered by University of Michigan. Uh, you can say that there are forty nine k forty nine k students forty nine thousand students in this class, uh, and uh, you will have to register, join for free, register and uh and meant and other things are there so you can see this is a complete online course okay so uh online course that means everything is online nothing is uh, face to face or nothing is connected with our traditional classroom setting so this is one of the most popular uh, mooc provider mooc course provider uh now uh what's what uh, uh, let me let me uh, Go for the another course also. The EDX is the another one offered by Harvard and MIT. Uh, hundreds of universities, are, and it it uh, was established uh, a few years after uh, Coursera. But again, there are several IITs courses also there. So IITs and IIMs are, are also offering course uh, in this EDX platform. Even uh, for in our Ramanujan College uh, Faculty Development Program, we used this. Uh, one of this uh, open version of edx platform for conducting our faculty development programs okay so this was another uh, popular mooc this is another um, major mooc provider uh, others are private players like udemy uh, you will find uh, some technical courses uh, especially for it people or there are hundreds of courses there and this is in for uh, charge so you can see there are 450 uh, 455 rupees 455 
so this is like a common and again it is most popular even you can also uh, post your course here if you find anything good okay so udemy is another platform uh, in india we have our swam platform swam is again they are inspired uh, by uh, this uh, edx of uh, mit and they also offer 500 plus courses uh, and there are several institutes uh, which uh, which are a part of even uh, I was also part of an ARPIT uh, program in this same platform and we prepared a complete course in this platform. Yeah, even you can also apply if you have some good idea then uh, what you will have to do you will have to prepare a three minute introductory video of that course and you can submit it to same platform. They will scrutinize it and if they find it uh, useful then uh, you can uh, also have a swam course uh, on this platform okay so uh, i will uh, let you know how to go about it uh, uh, this mooc courses all right so uh, this was about mooc courses uh, what is the basic need of a uh, mooc course and especially in this present time and why uh, can it there are a few questions about this mooc can it uh, replace the whole uh, traditional classroom teaching uh, or it or is it is is it better than uh, blended mode of learning and uh, and what is what are the benefits of uh, going for mooc uh, uh, people, especially uh, the people who, who are uh, some senior faculty, especially uh, I mentioning that they they don't feel comfortable in going for completely online courses. They find it uh, that we are not interacting with the students face to face, and it's uh, it will take uh, the place of traditional classroom setting. And there are several questions regarding MOOC. Uh, but I will present my view on this. Uh, first point is that it cannot. Uh, take the place of traditional classroom setting it's 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 a supportive kind of thing uh, you can see that uh, coursera uh, has been there since 2012 but still uh, it has not replaced several there are this is a billion dollar now platform coursera course is billion dollar platform it's a big 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 industry a big big uh, industry now and uh, still uh, and it was it was started with uh, started by stanford university computer science uh, people and range in definite color but it's still there stanford university is still there and the traditional custom uh, is still there so you can see eight years and still uh, it is running parallel uh, with our traditional classrooms uh, setting in Stanford University. Okay, so it was started by Stanford University, but still both are uh, going pal in hand in hand. What are the benefits of it uh, uh, for having a MOOC course? The first benefit is the uh, reach. So you can reach uh, use a large audience with uh, this MOOC course, uh, uh, which we cannot. Uh, reach with uh, the, our traditional classrooms so i'm not saying that traditional classroom uh, mooc is better than traditional classroom setting it's uh, you you know if you have a lesser audience and you want a face-to-face -face interaction our traditional classroom setting is perfect and no one can uh, no other thing no other uh, approach can replace that uh, traditional classroom but for uh if you have say, say for example uh there's a uh, medical a plant specialist in say Uttarakhand, a village in Uttarakhand. Now, uh, what what is the problem in that? Uh, that he uh, is teaching there uh, about medicinal plants, but uh, the audience is limited. So he teach say every year uh, 40, 30 to 40 students, and he's a perfect. So what what uh, if suppose I want to know about medicinal plants so I, either I will have to go there but suppose uh, I am in India and the, the, the that person is in say uh, New Zealand so I cannot afford that uh, like going there and learning that thing so this is uh, this is again the uh, good option for these kind of courses so if you find that you are some specialist in something and you want that knowledge uh, should be there uh, for a larger audience then mooc is one of the best approach for doing that and you will find uh, hundreds of courses like for example i i in fact uh, i was interested in quantum computing uh, class and i couldn't find any uh, say, say any good uh, resource person uh, 
uh, in India, especially for say quantum internet. So I just opted for a MOOC course and I learned about that uh, quantum internet uh, through that MOOC course only. So uh, you say, you see, you can understand that uh, it is not, uh, I am not just replacing my classroom teaching. I am not going completely for online course, but it it is it is enhancing my knowledge in the form of uh, some good uh, in, in, in through this MOOC courses. Okay, so this was the uh, second utility, larger audience. Uh, first point, uh, why you should create your own MOOC. Second is uh, uh, if you have you are your specialist of search something and you want that that knowledge should be delivered to a larger audience then this is again a good thing and third is it is quite accessible especially with the uh, internet penetration is uh, going like for you can see the internet internet penetration in india it is increasing it, it is increasing very rapidly uh, in, even in remote areas it is going very fast because of the smartphones and you can uh, say that uh, in say five or ten years it will penetrate uh, the whole pan india so it will again so uh, in fact in our college fdp uh, uh, our first mooc fdp there were uh, more than 6000 participants okay so and uh, there were hundreds and thousands of participants uh, were from say uh, villages they were they used to go to cyber cafe to uh, learn uh, to to just go through our lectures and they submitted their assignments and uh, they learned and they especially uh, messaged us that we we have learned a lot through that uh, fdp so you can see that uh, 6000 people uh, in 15 days and we have tried to give them knowledge and uh, without and you can say the cost of uh, doing this so the cost was like nothing if you compare training a 6000 student in traditional classroom setting then you will see that it will cost uh, uh, in fact it will go in crores okay so one course in 6000 uh, participants and if you want to teach them in traditional classroom setting it will go in crores crores of rupees but through this MOOC uh, we were able to deliver a uh, we, will, we will not say that we have done 100 percent perfection i have we have not achieved 100 percent perfection but we have uh, at least uh if we were uh, able to uh, teach most of the things and uh, uh, people were uh, able to just because we took assignments so we can say it confidently that uh, uh, most of most of the participants they were able to create their video content they were able to create uh, their google classrooms and several other things so you can see that why mooc is important and especially in uh, developing nations like india uh, because uh, suppose ashwini sir is an expert in some uh, something very good and uh, he he's just teaching in in his classroom setting and there are few uh, few students every year they will say 100 students per year but uh, maybe ashwini sir is expert in certain thing and which should be delivered to a larger audience so book is again a very uh, effective way of doing this and because of it it is gaining popularity and it is not going to replace our traditional classroom setting and uh, you will uh, get definitely get benefit of going for MOOC uh before moving to next the things if you have any query then you can ask uh like uh, if you have any doubt or if you want to share anything you can just uh, say anything about this mooc and uh, if you have any point to uh, to make it i then you can raise uh, you can unmute yourself and you can uh, ask uh, otherwise i will move ahead so uh coming back to how to create your MOOC and uh, if you want uh, to have your own MOOC how you can go for it okay so uh, the first way as I said in India uh, or even in abroad uh, the first way is applying for your MOOC course so what you will have to do you will have to prepare some introductory thing or sample videos and you will have to uh, just share it with say swam or ugc ugc event i it was earlier program so ugc cec it was a program for creating MOOC, so consortium for uh, education so even uh, i i'm not sure about uh, that it is still there or not but uh, 
it, you can submit your proposal in UGC CEC also earlier. And now you can uh, you can just submit your proposal in uh, SOM platform also. And if you find that uh, your content is quite amazing and it, it is of international level, then you can uh, submit it uh, to EDX also. So if you have a good course with you and you have prepared few video lectures and you have uh, some e-content regarding uh, that uh, course then you can submit your proposal to edx.org also and they can offer you uh, to have that course in your, their platform also okay so ugc cec uh, edx uh, international platform and uh, swam indian platform and uh, if you want it to be a, some commercial type of courses then you can go for udemy so it's a private body uh, uh, udemy uh, but uh, uh, an edx and it it is somewhere controlled by universities system so you can say it a government type of thing edx and courser and uh, some commercial type of uh, courses like uh, udemy and there are also like linda and uh, uh, a few, few, few uh, other players are also there in India. Even there are some uh, Manipal University have launched their course. MIT University they have uh, their own MOOC platform, and it's better. I would recommend that uh, um, if it is possible, then every un big university and all most of the universities, if they can manage it, they should have their own uh, MOOC platform, MOOC courses. Okay, so. Uh, so this was about if you want to submit a proposal so if you want to submit your proposal then you can submit it on swams ugc cc uh, edx even in coursera so you can submit uh, your proposals there now if you want to have your own personal course so you want to see that uh, if i go for a mooc course and how how we can go for that so uh, through again there are two ways uh, either you can have a uh, course through open platforms and second through paid platforms okay licensed platforms so there are platforms which are paid and they will offer uh, good services uh, you know user friendly services so that you can prepare your mooc course and there are some open uh, source co open courses open platforms uh, which are free of cost but it will uh, require some kind of technical knowledge to use that or you will have you will need some technical help to uh, use that uh, those platforms so i will start with few commercial platforms like admodo is there admodo okay so you can have your uh, classroom MOOC courses uh, in this commercial platform it uh, i think a few parts are free but otherwise you will have to uh, pay for it i uh, other are like a blackboard learn so these are uh, these are some commercial platforms uh, through which you can prepare your uh, a complete mooc course uh, some open source codes open uh, platforms which are there uh, there are two famous platforms which can be used to create your uh, mooc codes first one which is quite popular is moodle okay i hope uh, you have heard about this moodle and there are several i think there are hundreds of webinars in india about this moodle so moodle platform uh, through this moodle platform you can create your own MOOC course so uh, if you don't want to submit it to SWAM or uh, say DX and you want to create your uh, own course first and you want to see it uh, that uh, how uh, people how students respond and uh, how if you want uh, to gain some confidence of creating MOOC, then you can start with uh, these uh, open platforms so Moodle is the first one and the second one which uh, uh, even we are using is open edx so open edx is just a platform developed by edx uh, so open source that means you don't have to pay for it but it requires some technical knowledge to configure it and use it uh, so it's not uh, quite it's it's a, a typical uh, uh, so technical process involved in uh, using this so uh, one cannot go directly uh, 
by for for this open edx they will need some technical help so but these are the two platforms open source platforms which can be used to create your uh, mooc course okay so massive open online course uh, so so this this was about platforms so uh, if you want to submit your proposal then swam edx are there and if you want to have your own mooc course first you want to see that and you want to launch it on your own then Moodle and OpenEdX or some commercial platforms like Edmode and Blackboard Learn are there. Okay, so this was about uh, creating MOOCs on uh, platforms. Okay, now uh, let's come to the point that what what should be the contents in the MOOC? So how what are the what are the things you need to ensure before creating your MOOC course? Okay. So uh, the first thing is the, the first major thing which is there uh, in creating a MOOC is uh, video contents. So as you see, this is online course. So you will have to you will have to prepare video contents so that it can be uploaded uh, on these platforms. Okay. So uh, video contents some text contents uh, e contents for some uh, most of us call it as e contents also so some text content uh, in the form of pdf image or uh, uh, word document so uh, it should be there uh, quizzes and assignments and uh, some provision for taking final exam and certification some uh, admission process uh, feedbacks so all these things should be integrated in this MOOC uh, course. So you will have to prepare these contents. So you will have to prepare video contents, e-contents, quiz assignment, assignments, and uh, final exam. So we, uh, and, uh, and and certificates. So you will have to uh, prepare before uploading these contents on uh, these platforms. Uh, your contents on these platforms uh, in Open edX or Moodle. Okay, so uh, what are what are the ways of creating uh, uh, these contents? Uh, there are some platforms. So I cannot cover these uh, things in this a single lecture, but I can just uh, mention it, and you can learn it uh, through different mediums. So regarding video contents, uh, there are several softwares. Uh, like we used to, uh, we, we we can or even use this uh, Google Meet or Zoom or uh, Microsoft Team, and uh, one of the most popular open source software for that is OBS. So you can prepare your video content through these tools. Okay, so video content doesn't mean that uh, you should go for face recording, like uh, uh, you speak in front of camera and you record that and you just upload it. It should be. Uh, variety of videos so it should be of some face recording some screen capturing so recording of your screen whatever you're doing on your screen like for example this webinar so what i am doing on my screen it is getting recorded so this you can also call as a, this, this uh, you can consider this also as a video content okay so uh, some presentation so uh, you can open your presentation and you speak about that so again the, that kind of video content a uh, mixture of these things like uh, you are uh, presenting something and you are also showing yourself in some corner window so these things should be this uh, variety of videos should be there uh, it should be of uh, most of uh, the videos should be of short duration because attention span uh, of uh, this video is not it is not good if uh, it's it's better to have short videos so edx uses that kind of thing even we used uh, this strategy in our faculty development record programs also using of short recorded videos so that uh, they can uh, go for the whole video otherwise what happens uh, student used to skip if you if they see that the video is of uh, say one hour length then they will try to skip uh, these videos by forwarding it so it's better to have a shorter effective videos uh, so that uh, student can just go for it and complete and even uh, this is proven actually if you see uh, some videos on youtube of about any topic you will find a shorter videos have uh, maximum views uh, in comparison to uh, 
longer videos so you should also take care about the length of the videos uh, the other things uh, which you should uh, take care about is that uh, you you should not use your copyrighted things so you should avoid uh, it because it's uh, because of because this is uh, because of lack of awareness most of us use uh, copyrighted content we just copy something from net and we use it to prepare some our video content or some e content we should avoid using that you should always use uh, those contents only which are uh, open source in nature okay so open educational resources so there are hundreds of sites which offer open educational resources you should use those resources only uh, if you are some taking something from internet okay uh, and you should ensure that if you are using copyrighted things then you should uh, take permission from the author so i will just go f about this in say three four minutes so how to find that content is uh, open under open education resource or it's it's uh, legal to use that so let me let me find uh, some thing on say you are preparing something on uh, india uh, or uh, let me uh, say find corona virus on internet so say uh, i will find will try to find image on internet so suppose you want to use this uh, this image you'll find that uh, image you'll find if you find that this message is subject to copyright so you will have to ensure that uh, you will have to go to this website and we'll have to find that uh, it you can use this or not because if it is copyrighted then you will have to write email to uh, this bbc you, you will see this this message also so copyright the at the rate of uh 2020 bbc so that means everything uh, on this site is copyrighted and maybe this video also and this image also so you will have to write to this bbc to uh, just get permission to use that image okay so you will have to ensure that this is, is not copyrighted otherwise uh if let me find it uh, on say uh these sites like wikipedia let me let me use some other content for that so if you if i find uh, say india wikipedia so most of the wikipedia content are they are uh, under public domains so you, you can use the content from wikipedia directly okay uh, so, uh, if i use any image let me see uh, see this image so, so this is the image and if symbol so c and cross public domain so that means you don't have to take permission to use this image in your video or intent you can use it directly because it's under public domain so you should use all those things which are in public domain and you don't have to seek permission from anyone you can use it directly okay so this symbol either this symbol c and cross and either or it is if it is written public domain okay so this was the second so the first type was uh, like uh, if it is copyrighted then you will have to ask permission from the author and if it is in public domain then you don't have to ask uh, permission from the author you can use it directly uh, in your content either e-content or your video content and uh, the third is uh, like a creative commons license so there is another category uh, which we call as creative commons licenses so it, it it's in between public license and uh, uh, copyrighted so if you see this symbol cc symbol uh, below any image or any video or any e con text content or any type of content if you see this then you can use it directly without uh, taking permission from the author 
but you will have to specify their name so suppose uh, i have clicked a photograph and i have uploaded it on my website uh, and you want to use that image in your say powerpoint slide or e uh, even in your video content then what you will have to do you can use that photograph directly without asking permission from me okay you can use it directly but you will have to uh, mention my name uh, there that this photograph has been taken by Nikhil Rajput okay so these this type of uh, licenses are called as creative comma licenses in which you don't have to seek permission from the author but you will have to uh, specify their name while uh, using uh, their their uh, ideas or their things like photograph or images or videos okay so even you can uh, find uh, several other things also so if you go to this site creativecommons.org then uh, you will find several other uh, things like uh, uh, these are jpmendo for music uh, photographs uh, educational materials so all these things are under creative Commons license that means you can use these uh, license these videos or contents free of cost uh, and without uh, asking permission from the author uh, but you will have to mention their name that means uh, you will have if you are using any uh, audio uh, from this gemendo site then you will have to uh, seek permission from uh, that the creator of that audio file okay uh, any question till now otherwise i will move ahead if you have any question then you can raise all right uh, so this was a basic idea of uh, mooc so uh, as i said i will just recap uh, the things very quickly that uh, uh, you why to why you should go for mooc if you are specialized in anything and if you want to reach to a broader audience uh, mooc is completely online course that means uh, a student will have to take admission in that course uh, they will have to enroll like uh, like our regular course enrollment uh, they will have to go through lectures either in the form of video content or in or some mixture of e content and video content uh, now uh, and after that they will have to take some uh, they will have to just go through some assignments quizzes and uh, other things they will have to take their final exam uh, and if they qualify then they will uh, get some degree or say certificate for completing that course so the whole process is online it's not uh, it's not just like it's, it's you can compare it with traditional uh, classroom and if you use a mixture of some online tools along with your traditional classroom it's called a blended learning so uh, after some time when the this covid time will be over you can go for blended learning uh, rather than going for complete uh, traditional classroom setting so you can use some mixture of uh, things some other tools uh, to have your blended learning uh, MOOC courses as I said uh, either you can submit proposal if you are ready with your contents then you can submit your the proposal to organizations like uh, EDX, Coursera, uh, SWAM, UGCCEC or uh, if you want to go for a commercial uh, uh, platform, then you can uh, go for Udemy uh, and Linda and other platforms uh, for uh, your MOOC courses. And uh, what uh, and uh, if you want to have your own MOOC course, uh, so without some, if you don't want to submit your proposal to the authorities and you want to have uh, your own uh, MOOC course then you can uh, go for some commercial platforms like Admoto Blackboard Learn or for uh, or uh, some open source platforms like Moodle and OpenEdX the problem with Moodle and OpenEdX is that it is free the, but uh, the configuration is a bit uh, difficult and you need some technical expert uh, who can assist you in creating your uh, MOOC course in that platform and you can uh, attach that uh, your MOOC course with your say university website or say your personal website uh, 
okay so this was about uh, platforms now uh, regarding the contents uh, the contents uh, in a mooc course is mostly in the form of videos uh, it, it, you should prefer shorter videos and uh, you should use different kind of video recordings rather than going for face recording face facial recording okay so you can have a uh, screen recording you can have a uh, say uh, presentation and your voice you can have mixture of these things even you can have a field work like of things so you are going to a field and uh, just uh, recording the things you are speaking about it and uh, you can use this uh, videos okay so um, video content e-content e-content uh, like uh, it, it should not only in the form of text it should be uh, some kind of image interactive image and even in the form of mind maps also so there are different kinds of uh, e-content also so uh, as i uh, there are different kind of video contents so there are different kind of of uh, e content also so you can have different uh, variety of e contents along with your uh, different video contents okay so for before prepare going for a mooc course you should be you should prepare these contents uh, before you upload it on any platform okay so and you should ensure that it's uh, whatever you are using uh, it should not be copyrighted because uh, suppose you are presenting something you are creating your video content then and uh, you are uh, using any copyrighted thing then it it can just uh, uh, let you in problem in future uh, uh, in india most of us ignore this uh, we don't care about this otherwise it's it's uh, quite Ill uh, illegal in uh, european and american countries so you should ensure that you are not using copyrighted thing without uh, asking the permission asking permission from the author or the creator and uh, if you are going for sub creative common license thing or uh, public domain thing you can use it freely uh, in public licensed uh, images or any content you don't have to seek permission from the creator but in case of creative commons license you can use that things directly but you will have to seek uh, you will have to just mention the name of the creator or the author okay so this was a basic structure or basic uh, idea about creating uh, MOOCs okay so uh, if you have any query then you can ask otherwise i will i can go for a few more things but i think the time is not much here uh, dr nikhil there are two questions here uh, yes ma'am we want to know do such moves help in job and do these certificates have any scope yes yes definitely uh, especially uh, now aict uh, are planning in fact uh, if, 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 if we talk about swam then uh, most of the engineering institutes they offer credit for uh, for these courses also and uh, ugc is also planning the same so uh, in future you will see that uh, these courses will benefit the students uh, in form of obtaining some credit not whole credit so suppose uh, uh, there was a course in most of the courses uh, which we in in our cbca system there are a four credit or six credit so what they are offering that, that the students can also go for say one or two credit of online courses okay so this was uh, this is the first thing regarding job definitely it will help help because uh, the suppose uh, i learned quantum quant computing uh, from say edx platform and uh, the course uh, was say offered by say uh, university of pennsylvania so if i have, have that certificate then i co can go to industry directly that i have learned these things i have obtained these these marks in this course and it's recognized by uh, university of say pennsylvania so university of pennsylvania is a recognized institute and uh, uh, their course is valid okay but one should ensure that they are not uh, going for say some random courses which are not very much recognized so say swam courses they are recognized in india 
and uh, you can just present that we have gone through this swam course and even our say our courses also because uh, we are also part of mhrd tlc so uh, we can say that our degrees are also valid in some sense okay so these de uh, degrees and certificates are will definitely uh, add in your resume and uh, most uh, and most important is thing is that you you, can, you will learn different things through these mooc uh, okay so uh, suppose uh, you, uh, you are planning to uh, learn some say aromatic plants or anything uh, uh, other things so you can uh, go for some recognized mooc and you, uh, even you can pursue career in that field also so it it is going to add in every sense like uh, it will add in some in form of some credit in future and in engineering institute it's already there uh, it will definitely help in jobs because uh, they are recognized if you if anyone have a degree say California Institute then th that uh, certificate is all definitely will be recognized by the industry and other uh, sectors business sectors uh, and uh, definitely it will you will learn new things through these MOOC courses okay uh, any other question you can ask any questions because i just want that it should be more interactive rather than more monologue uh, it's better if you have any doubt any query if any other thought then you can ask directly uh, dr uh, nikhil yes, uh, yes, yes, uh, yes. wonderful presentation uh, so i just i don't have a question i just have uh, you know information uh, you talked about uh, moocs you can uh, inter uh, do your own moocs at your uh, colleges also Mm -hmm. And uh, in Ohio University here, we have Ilias implemented. I don't okay. know word about uh, it's actually something very similar to uh, Moodle, okay. and uh, it's a German product actually. University of Cologne, Germany designed it. So we are utilizing uh, this uh, uh, platform for our. We, we are not doing a complete uh, MOOCs environment. We are doing a blended learning. Okay. So our students are part of this, uh, you know, Ilias platform, and. Uh, uh, routinely conducting online tests and uh, uh, feedback mechanism is integrated in it and also all the course material from all subjects all uh, you know across the uh, you know universities uh, institutes uh, uh, all up updated and even our uh, faculty also trained so probably a little bit more training you know we will be able to uh, you know create our own MOOCs platform also that's great sir that's really great because uh, you should uh, we need to upgrade ourselves uh, in this field also because we are we in india what we i find that i have uh, uh, gone to several other countries also uh, when i was in australia and uh, what i find found that uh, they uh, the teachers uh, they regularly upgrade themselves but right. in India, right. we, we have a set of mind that uh, why we should learn things we are we are more teacher centric rather than student centric because yes. today's students this millennial generation is very tech savvy and uh, if, if we will like it or not like it but we will have to just adapt ourselves so that we can teach the uh, the students and uh, the students they can find most of the contents on uh, say youtube and other things but we will have to uh, we will have to be facilitated that they should go for a good information rather than bad information so our and role has know. has increased now and we will have to upgrade ourselves uh, so that we can just cope up with this all these changes and we can uh, go for this international standards because they are they are very uh, up, they are regularly updating themselves Okay, so, exactly. uh, yes, yes. Sir. So it's that's it's, why in my opening remark also I talked about uh, for IT you cannot expect anybody to help you. You know exactly. you upgrade yourself, then only you know you will be able to uh, you know uh, do your work uh, in I IT environment uh, because any anybody cannot uh, teach you how to create uh, you know MOOC course or you know it's all left to you how you want to implement it you have to learn step by step one by one, one after the other uh, there is but then only you can do it that's what i wanted to stress exactly exactly so definitely every teacher each and every teacher in our country they will have to upgrade themselves uh if, uh, even they like it or not like it but we will have to upgrade what what i feel and uh, what i can see uh, and I am happy that uh, most of us they are they are trying at least most of us yeah. are, they just want that uh, we should learn things. 
okay so rather than uh, escaping uh, from these things we should integrate it in our daily practice and we can uh, it's not very difficult it's not code intensive now so it's not like we will have to code anything there are the things are built in and we will have to use in, even you will see that uh, in amsterdam um, in netherland there are schools like uh, they are using augmented reality for uh, just teaching uh, the kids uh, the thing so rather uh, even in kerala i was reading a newspaper uh, in their uh, online classes they were using like they were demonstrating about elephant and uh, the uh, through uh, augmented reality uh, elephant was there in that their classroom so student will find that things very interactive and they will just feel very connected through these things okay right. so uh, i'm not saying that we are uh, these things will replace uh, books but uh, these things will definitely help in uh, learning the books more e effectively so we should uh, you upgrade ourselves and use these practices in our uh, teaching so if you are not going for MOOCs directly then we should uh, ad adapt ourselves to be trained in blended learning okay so uh, we should uh, try definitely and it definitely does and it's great that you are uh, doing this in your institute and i think uh, other institutes should also learn these things from you and your institute uh, that's really great that you are implementing these things in your university thank you uh, dr yeah. yes. uh, any other query any other or any other remark here yeah. Uh, Sir, I, yeah, but I think we are done with the questions. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for that informative talk. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure having you with us, sir. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Neha, ma'am. Thank I'm you, Rajesh, sir. Yeah, and thank you, uh, Shani, sir, for. Uh, I would now like to call upon uh, the next speaker for today, Dr. Ashwini Dutt. Our Associate Dean and Professor, Department of Physiology, Yenapoya Medical College. Dr. Dutt has completed his medical graduation from Sri Siddhartha Medical College, Tumpur, and his post-graduation in Physiology from Kasturba Medical College, Mangalore. He has completed various courses, to name a few, PG Diploma course in Bioethics and, Medi Bioethics and Medical Ethics from Yenapoya University, FAMER from PSG FAMER Regional Institute, Coimbatore, and postgraduate diploma in healthcare institution, education management and administration from IGNU, New Delhi. He has to his credit 44 articles published in various reputed journals. He is an editorial board member of four journals and a peer reviewer for eight journals. He has been instrumental in organizing many workshops in the university. He is a faculty for, at PhD Center, NAC coordinators of Yenapoya Medical College, chairman board of studies, member board of examination, member of Center for Health Professions Education, Com Curriculum Committee, Scientific Review Board, Coordinator for Implementing Outcome-Based Education, Coursera MOOC, Digital Learning, Simulation Team of Axian, IQSAC of Yenapoya deemed to be university. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Neha. And thank you, Dr. Abhay, for the opportunity that is provided to address the next topic that is on online assessment. I'll just share my screen. Yes, the topic that I have selected is on online assessment. So what I'll be handling in the next 15 minutes or so. So what is online assessment? What are the prerequisites in implementing these assessments? What are all the assessment options? What are all the tools available? What are all the technology assisted examination methods, recommendations, benefits and challenges? It's a huge topic. I just try my level best to condense it in this limited period. Okay, so what this word assessment means? It comes from the Latin word aside, which means to sit by the side, sit beside. And assessment is the engine which drives student learning. 
and the most important what is required with assessment is the feedback so our feedback is the oil which can lubricate this engine so assessment has to go with feedback to make it a complete sense so our education system is like this with one side we have got the different teaching learning methods we have got assessments which are all linked to the objectives assessment drives learning so our classrooms have changed like this and it's all technology which has changed our education system so how this technology has entered into an education system so there was an era when no cell phone use in the classroom not to be brought anywhere to the campus next situation came where some feedback some questions can be answered in the classroom with the smartphone next in 2020 thanks to this corona so we are asking these questions which device you are using for the e classes do you have good internet connectivity which mobile network you are using and how much data is used per day so just see how it was in the beginning and how it has transformed so before we go into the online assessment let us quickly go through what is online teaching cycle it starts with the objectives of the session with a clear lesson plan how much should be the duration of the session what are all the resources that you are going to share you need to plan the content you need to chunk the content in such a way that it is systematically produced and given to the student so that it will not be a burden so what is the delivery whether you are going to use the theory platform or a practical or a discussion or a case discussion or seminar appropriate technology be ready if plan a fails be ready with a plan b so you need to have a backup plan and engaging interactive session multiple freely online available applications are there we have used all these mentimeter or kahoot or meet to or quizzes or polls everywhere and assessment so you can use these online platforms and also your learning management system that's available we need to give the feedback which is essential component of the online teaching so this is online teaching cycle and we are here where the assessment component is what we will be handling so what is this online assessment any means of assessing student achievement providing feedback or moving the students towards their learning process in online mode so that's the definition given for online assessment so either it can be formative or it can be summative formative to monitor the student's progress or summative to evaluate the students against the set standards so what are all the prerequisites for implementing this online assessment we need to have good institutional policies whether our management our policies are clear related to ict integration for assessment whether we have got sufficient access for the internet to use multiple freely available online web based tools whether we have got a good technology based or learning management system for the post session delivery or during the delivery of the sessions whether we have got the capacity building for the staff in training related to online teaching as well as the assessment whether we are conducting any faculty development programs for this we need sufficient technical support so overall it is the technology which is the key component for implementing the online assessment next what are all the assessment options we need to have a learning management system which can be used in a multiple way for conducting the online tests it can be multiple choice questions whether a discussion forum collecting feedback the portfolios with multiple options available notification calendar etc we at enapoya we use engage we call it as engage based on the elias platform and just now we had a session related on moodle not only that we can use multiple google apps for education google classroom google forms google site google calendar google drive with microsoft office word excel comments feedback and not but not the least the social media facebook youtube can also be used for assessment options so there are multiple tools which are available freely which i am going to share this article i have used this padlet i have used kahoot google sites google forms and how this can be learned so with an instructive model with clear cut instructions one can learn by going through these sites 
not only that you have got web tools which can be used the rubric makers if you are not sure how you want the rubrics to be involved clear cut blueprinting you can go for these sites next comes what are all the expectations what we are expecting from this online assessment there has to be 100% success rate and not a single student should suffer because of technology failure so we need to make sure that this technology should help in our assessments also it should be a fair exam we know that our students are much 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 brilliant compared to us and they find one or the other ways to cheat or can have malpractice so we need to have a fair exam student should be satisfied initially when we tried this method so they were reluctant to go ahead for this online assessment but once we gave clear cut instruction and guidelines they were convinced and they were satisfied with the method that we followed so students have to be a part of this whole program and what teachers expect what are all the objectives not just for the purpose of conducting an assessment you need to go for an online assessment what is the purpose what is the objective of this assessment the teachers must be clear okay what are the different methods which we have tried i am not going to all these details because many of you have gone through all these things an assessment based exam learning management system using with multiple choice question online viva online student seminars short answer test discussion forums online games with assessment e portfolios written assessments projects take home exam with online monitoring theory exam in open book mode practical exam self and peer assessment tasks i am going to just go with only these which are highlighted here assessment assignment based exam you give a set of questions at the end of your topic ask your students to write the answers and scan it and then upload that to your learning management system and then faculty is going to evaluate based on a checklist that is developed in their department this online viva was it's again to be conducted in small groups one to one with multiple faculty involved clear guidelines for the faculty and students should be there multiple faculty with meeting guidelines to be created it depends on the technology so if there is any problem on the other side so you can give an option it can be conducted at a later time also it's a very effective method to evaluate the students understanding and there is a face to face interaction and students feel this is the best examination method when compared to other modes next this is how we have conducted the online seminar presentations they present it with an interactive way with concept maps with the flow charts they use the ipad they draw it and they show it so this is so you can give a set of topics so they will have some particular time on the day of presentation with a different innovative way they are going to present this is an online seminar presentation so you have to devise your own assessment method or a checklist how you are going to assess these students next coming to group discussions it can be a written discussion in the form forums of the learning management system so you divide the whole group if you have got 150 students divide them into batch a b c with 50 students they are going to write the answers and you be a facilitator and they are going to upload the relative material on the learning management system or you can have a oral group discussion with an e portal again instead of writing part they are going to discuss amongst themselves and this is all live with the faculty acting as a moderator with a case based or it can be a topic based which is decided by the faculty and how you are going to evaluate based on the participation on the checklist again left to the departments to develop or the rubric to be developed so this what we tried in our department where i just opened any clarifications you have got in the nervous system topic so one started one student asked a question some other started responding to that some other shared a relevant article or a resource material some other came with a different question and some other answered some shared an article so this is how a collaborative learning that can happen with the discussion forum of the learning management system okay we have used this discussion forum but how you are going to evaluate this is the next question there are a set of criteria that can be followed you can just give within this period you have to complete you have to post 
and there should not be any copy pasting type questions so timely discussion of contributions and whether they have demonstrated a higher order thinking whether they are adhering to the online protocols or the etiquettes and you can just grade it excellent good average good so that you can decide and based on this you can summarize the total points which they got yes next the most important thing what we tried is take full theory exam with online monitoring so you need to divide the number of students into small groups so we have developed this module and we got validated this with the experts and we piloted and we implemented across all the colleges of our university so where you are going to divide the students into small groups clear guidelines to be given to the students as well as to the faculty and then at a particular time they are going to switch on their cameras and sit with a proper guidance and the instructions and set of questions which are of at the higher order you are going to prepare and then within the specified team time they are going to answer to those questions and then scan it immediately send to the whatsapp groups to which they are placed and then also upload that to the learning management system and it will be everything will be evaluated online only so this is a take home exam theory exam with online monitoring so this what we did in our institutions so what are all things which are required for this type of examination multiple faculty as have to we had in fact some 30 faculty which were involved for monitoring 150 students clear planning and selection of the type of questions which have to be at higher order or thinking type or analytical type faculty need to be trained on this mode of examination you need to get validation of the examination process you need to have a piloting before doing it and guidelines for monitoring the students to be prepared malpractice this is one thing as i've already told students are very very clever in one or the other way they are going to cheat it but make sure that you have clear cut guidelines in monitoring and still this can be managed if you discuss with the students what is the essential component and why we are behind this assessment or this online mode of examination they will be convinced and 99% might convince and 1% you can't help it so it is thinking technology dependent yes gamification our students as rightly pointed out they are tech savvy so gamification of this assessment you have got multiple tools which are available so these are all things which i have used the quizzes or the kahoot or just the google forms can be highly effective or the mentimeter reports anywhere so creative so these are all the things which i have used and i know that many others have used all these things simple crosswords or jigsaw puzzle or the quizzes you have got multiple online free platforms which are available it can be a part of your unit tests or the formative assessment or at the end of each class each session this can be used and believe it or not just within few minutes they are going to complete this assessments and they like this and they expect this again and again similarly what are all the important diagrams that students must draw must remember during their examination process and that can be made it as a jigsaw puzzle and they can just use this platform for clarifying and answering it next comes theory exam in open book mode exam should the students take their exam in the residence they are going to scan it with a specified period and then they are going to upload that to learning management system and teachers are going to evaluate this and mark them manually so faculty have to be trained in setting the type of questions it cannot be just simple recall type it has to be again at the critical or analytical based questions how much is the duration of examination how much should be the number of questions validation of the whole process is an important component next most challenging is to conduct the practical exam not all exams can be conducted by online mode you can try oski oski with knowledge based recall questions using clinical videos instruments graphs images use of simulation based modules presentation of video which we have tried in our department as i have told not all practical sessions can be conducted and we need to explore each department we need to explore the ways with which this can be conducted so this what we tried you can see there is one examination which was in oski online mode checking the blood pressure 
then there is a chart they have to calculate they have to answer to these questions identify this explain so there is another question so there are some values given interpret this and there is a question related to that so we are showing here a case video looking into this what is the interpretation and in which condition this can result in again another video what is this and what are all the steps which are involved so this how you can conduct the online practical examination so what are all the strategies other strategies you can have even concept mapping or mind mapping digital posters or media projects reflection reflective writing or journaling or blogging research projects can be discussed in online and then they can submit the simulation or virtual laboratories now it's coming up in everywhere so online activities which are simulation based with create cut scenarios where students have to complete the task to complete and to get the course certification next comes what are all the recommendations for this assessment we need to start early and design properly clear cut instructions rubrics and expectations space for the students to ask questions clear cut feedback portal variety of assessment types we cannot just have only one method always variety of assessment formative methods can be used when you are going to have which method there has to be a clear cut blueprinting of this assessment strategies also it has to be at a interactive and higher order thinking we can use videos simulations and case studies specific feedback to be given with detailed comments formative feedback for suggestions for improvement for the future work if you are dealing with the small group have a plan for promoting academic integrity that is the most important thing so we need to take students into confidence discuss with them why we are doing this method of examination we should take them into confidence and then we need to plan in such a way that there won't be any chance for malpractice if plan a fails be ready with a plan b contingency plan and make note of how students work is recorded so everything has to be in recorded with our learning management system and also we can clearly know how the students have progressed so what is the drawback so that can be checked later what are all the benefits of this online assessment we can give detailed feedback if you are in a small group in start immediately you can give a feedback accessibility is fine flexible if plan a fails you have got plan b if now it is not happening it can be postponed to some other time collaborative learning if you use the discussion forum effectively it can be a very useful platform so that are all the benefits what are all the challenges related for workload we are overburdened with so many works training we need the training for all the faculty members academic integrity so how to overcome this cheating by the students or the malpractice students are isolated we are not seeing one to one so this can be even managed with a online one to one examination technical issues yes there are but with the advancement of it so this can be limited maximally for the students equity so all may not fairness again if one student cheats so that is going to affect the whole system technical issues yes may be around 1 or 2% not more so different technical abilities this our students are tech savvy so that can also be managed so this cannot be considered as a challenge at all but the most important thing is we need to change our mindsets and also the mindset of the students we have that resistance for anything that is coming up new or innovative thing why we have to do this what is the benefit are we going to get anything extra in our salary so that's the mindset that we have got so we need to overcome that this is for my benefit i am progressing this i am learning new things i am becoming a lifelong learning so that is what is required at this situation yes overcoming the challenge the resistance technology the moment we use it technology no we cannot we cannot use mobile phones in the classrooms yes that was earlier but now the change the time has changed and we need to change in this way so all the good online assessment practice there has to be a balance between formative and summative 
learning assessment should go hand in hand and we need to develop the skills for the 21st century and we have seen this bloom's taxonomy of education and how it has changed with the existence of this online teaching just see here we know that bloom's cognitive level remember understand apply analyze evaluate create this we all know but how it has changed remember youtube understand blogspot twitter apply cartoon drawer caso wiki analyze spreadsheet tools evaluate skype conferencing socrative notes create presentation tools prezi youtube so this is the era of technology and we need to change ourselves with this mode so to summarize so regardless of the context effective and rigorous assessment is essential in our education it is the means of fostering students learning motivating their engagement and evaluating their achievement yes research has highlighted benefits challenges strategies and good practices of online assessments and this research should be utilized within a specific context when developing new assessments or when transitioning assessments from face to face to online yes knowing the answers will help you in school but knowing how to question will help you in life so let's make assessment endeavors an enjoyable journey and let us start asking right questions no one has clapped from them from balconies no one did light a candle for their services they are un unlocking passion during lockdown attempting innovative ways to deliver the sessions updating themselves with n number of webinars reaching out to their students in all possible ways inspiring hard work remotely with determination instilling hope that everything and anything is possible and these are all the unsung heroes of this crisis period as they stay connected with their students so this is dedicated to all my teachers fellows thank you very much thank you sir for that wonderful session and inspiring us or making us more enthusiastic about being a teacher in such difficult times i request all the participants to type their questions in the chat box all the questions will be taken up at the end of the session last session now i now call upon our next speaker for the day dr janardan aitala professor of orthopedics and consultant spine surgeon in apoya medical college mangalore sir has completed his mbbs in the year 1992 from kmc mangalore he did his d ortho from bangalore medical college bangalore and dnb from ganga hospital with spine surgery and orthopedic trauma as his area of interest he has had additional fellowships for the same he has a keen interest in quality research he has 17 publications to his credits nearly half of which are in pubmed and scopus index journal apart from his clinical work sir is also having many additional roles he is an active member of meu yenapoya medical uh, college center for health professions uh, education uh, yenapoya going to be university scientific review board he is the chief coordinator for clinical audit and chairman of this safety committee over to you sir thank you dr neha for that uh, wonderful introduction am i audible yes sir yes sir now i will uh, share my screen is it visible yes sir good afternoon to all 
In the beginning, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Abhay Nirgude, Chairman of uh, Director of uh, CHPE, and uh, uh, Dr. Ashwini Dutt, Coordinator of this program, for giving me this opportunity. Well, talking about self-directed learning, I feel in the modern era, I think this is probably the most important or only form of education that we should follow. This concept is not new. If we look at it, uh, you know, in the ancient times, in this uh, Mahabharat, we hear the story of, uh, we know the story of Ekalavya, who kept Dronacharya as his mentor and uh, he learned the techniques of archery through a self-directed means. But then those who are very, I mean, isolated incidences. During those period, actually, the education was more about you know, serving the master and uh, trying to get information from the master, what we call Gurukula system. The students, they had to find a guru and then you know, serve him and finally extract the information. Gone are those days. Today, information is available everywhere in the internet. So if somebody says that I'm providing information, I think the situation will be like this. Students, definitely, they have access to almost you know, a lot of information. And they're already you know, learning what we call it as self-directed learning. But then what is our role or how best we can help them? Whatever the students they know, the, the access they have for the information, they may not understand what is the importance of that and uh, what is the, their goal, how to reach the final goal. So this is where I think the teacher has to work hard and then you know, provide or show them the goal so that they can select appropriate resources and you know, continue to learn themselves. So again, as I mentioned earlier, self-education is probably the only kind of education there is, was told by Isaac Asimov. So, in this background, today's my talk, I'll be, I'll be taking about 15 minutes. I will be covering these objectives to define what is self-directed learning, to discuss the need for self-directed learning in medical education, describe the advantages or benefits and challenges in implementing self-directed learning in medical colleges, steps and various competencies required, and to recognize various teaching learning methods and tools for STL, especially the role of ICT. Self-directed learning is defined as an individual's ability to take initiative, to set a learning goal, determine learning needs, identify materials needed to support learning, and monitor progress towards a goal. This was the definition given by Knowles in 1975. And it is self-explanatory. So here the student takes the initiative, he sets a goal to himself, and then determines what are the learning needs. And the same thing was told by Tuff in 1979. So how does the student learn? He learns by the past and present experiences, and then he interprets them. So he will learn. So what is the role of the teacher? His role is just a guide. He has to be a guide supporting students in exploring the world around them. What is the need for self-directed learning in the modern era? For that, there should be a context. We all know that once we are out of the medical school, I think the only way by which we can learn is by the self-directed learning. In fact, MCA has also no, has mentioned Lifelong learner as one of the competencies required for uh, the medical, I mean, uh, for uh, becoming an Indian medical graduate. And once you pa once we pass out of the medical school, our uh, need for self-directed learning depends upon our career demands and individual passions. Like there are so many options, like. Be becoming a doctor or a practitioner or a family physician, specialist, or even an administrator. So it depends upon our passion. But once we select, 
we need to decide what are the things we need to learn so self directed learning is definitely essential for a lifelong learner suppose in my own case once i passed out of my post graduation my passion was to become a medical college teacher so now because i wanted to become a medical college teacher that was my aim that was my career goal so i had to undergo training in uh, medical education i did some courses and uh, famer fellowship i wanted to take part in research so i underwent training in base, i mean uh, research methodology and of course as a teacher you need to be good in your own specialty so in my own specialty orthopedics i attended lot of fellowships trained myself made lot of publications and presentations so it's a constant improvement all these things something what i can say is the self directed learning which most of us everybody will follow so i don't think there's anything special in that but what is this self directed learning in a medical college when you are in a medical college in the modern era i think the educations are looking at encouraging self directed learning in the medical school itself so in a medical school actually the goals are already provided by the regulatory bodies like mci roughly this will translate into broad competency sub competency and learning objectives in the present uh, competency based medical education and these will serve as a platform or a goal for the self directed learning so from the pedagogical methods like the student becoming dependent on uh, the teacher and uh, relying more on the lectures and notes there has been an emphasis to move towards uh, making the student interested involved and finally self directed while the teacher's role from authority to facilitator or consultant so and accordingly the interactions also vary maybe lectures and notes when the student was dependent uh, dependent once the student became interested we can actually you know, encourage guided discussions from that group discussions and finally self directed learning so what are the benefits of self directed learning in medical schools it helps to develop the metacognitive skills increasing the increases the self awareness through reflective practice contributes to the development of critical reviewing skills helps the student to take control of their own learning and assessment and students the giving students greater agency regarding assessment thus enriching their learning if students know about their assessment before in hand they will be able to know uh, work towards that and uh, achieve better ratings and possibly in the long run reducing the teachers assessment workload well i'm specifying the word in the long run i know in the beginning in a short run it may be more work for the teachers in developing various you no know, contents materials and all those things but yes in the long run probably it will develop, you know, reduce the teachers assessment once you have developed the models so how efficient is uh, effective self directed learning this is a systematic review published in medical education in 2010 they looked at three aspects teachers act as facilitators rather than as source of content learners are involved in selecting learning resources and strategies learners are involved in self assessment of learning outcomes so these were the three things they looked at and their observations were they found moderate improvement in knowledge as effective as traditional teaching in imparting skills and effective domain while it is as effective but they were more effective when learners involve in identifying their resources and when we talk of resources various types of resources are available whether it can be an individual based or group based like for the cognitive skills we have written resources or group discussions for behavioral case based discussions or role plays psychomotor simulation or role play and team assignments so when the learner decides because each one has got you know a different uh, affinity or thing uh, towards a particular type of learning resource when he gets the choice he gets the student can get more interested and in such a scenario their learning abilities were much more than the their uh, efficiency of learning was much more than the traditional teaching 
this, these were the observations of this meta-analysis. So in a nutshell, we can see that this is a you know, career graph in which in the schools is actually mostly pedagogy, although there may be within the scope of pedagogy, there may be some scope for self-directed learning. In medical schools, definitely now there is an increasing you know, awareness towards self-directed learning and independent of pedagogy also. While yes, once we pass out, the only way by which we can learn is self-directed learning. So what is the role of a teacher in this? These are the four roles described in literature to assess whether the student is ready for learning, to provide learning objectives or help him to develop learning objectives and goals. That's how that's why that's how I would like to put it. To engage in learning process, to evaluate the learning and provide feedback. So it's the role of teacher has changed dramatically from, a, from like this, which was in the earlier days, to a position like this. Next, we will move on to the key components of self-directed or steps of self-directed learning. The first step is the educator acts as a facilitator. He's not a source of content, but he's a source of skill. So he will help the student to perform various other steps which are described below. Then the learner tries to identify his learning needs. This can be done by the self-evaluation and feedback. Development of learning objectives based on the needs that he has identified. So he has to devise learning objectives. Once learning, learning objectives are identified, the student decides on the appropriate resources. It can be ICT or other teaching learning methods. Then he implements the process. Once the implementation is done, he must show a commitment. To the learning contract that is important it is okay making a plan is okay but if we do not implement the plan then i think we are not going to make any progress so a commitment is required from the student this is one of the big problem in a self-directed learning well they make a lot of nice plans but whether they'll be pursuing it to achieve the final outcome is another matter and then at the end of it the student should evaluate with the help of a teacher so these are the steps in a self-directed learning. So what are the teaching learning methods? Group discussions, experiential learning, project works, problem-based learning, field trials, independent trials, general clubs, role plays. Some of them are group oriented. Some of them are individual based. I have discussed the resources in a few slides before. So I think each of them can be, you know, we can discuss about uh, separately but then because of the paucity of time i will just keep on this but yeah one of the important thing is the group discussions or group dynamics in a group the learning happens much faster and i think i remember some are seeing this johari's window so where there is definitely a scope for exchange of information where one is each member, we may be knowing a few things, and the other, our colleagues may be knowing a few things. So when we exchange things, the learning happens faster. What are the competencies required for self-directed learning? Number one, of course, self-assessment. Number two, feedback receiving characteristics. This is also an important thing. If feedback giving is different, receiving is different. We should be able to appreciate the feedback given by others. When we develop such characteristics, definitely we will get more, more and more feedback and that will help us in our own learning. Reflection, closely linked to self-assessment, planning and writing, learning objectives, and ability to identify appropriate resources and journals. And of course, finally, and most importantly, in the modern era, use of information technology and communication. So, that has become the most important thing both for the teacher as well as the student i'm going to discuss that a little bit next so among the competencies the student self-assessment it occurs when learners assess their own performances with practice they will learn how to objectively reflect on and critically evaluate their own progress and skill development and identify the gaps and discern and uh, decide on how to improve those gaps what are the areas in which they can do self-assessment or domains or how they can do? One is career goal. Suppose you no, know, they would like in the career, say they want to become a uh, good surgeon. Now, 
they should they can make an assessment on how far they have reached how, how far they have gone ahead what surgical competencies they have learned already can they go to the society and practice it so that is one way of assessing comparing with the peers patient and society requirements the amount of medical knowledge and skills they have acquired and of course professional satisfaction a closely linked technique or competency is reflection it's closely linked to the self assessment the latin origin is derived from the latin origin to bend or turn back it's a learning tool to look back and consider something is actually the word meaning but actually just looking back and consider something may not lead to a high level of analysis that is why a later another word is added to that critical reflection critical reflection is a process of analyzing questioning and reframing an experience in order to make an assessment of it for the purpose of learning so we do not learn from experience we learn from reflecting on the experience so this is an important thing which i remember even now when i was a post graduate we had an interesting case of an endocrine disorder so i was working in a government medical college so then to decide that we didn't have an endocrinologist in our institution one of the corporate hospitals had one so only one of his kind in bangalore at that moment this was in 1997 so when we went as a post graduate we went and discussed with him he asked us few questions about the patient uh, the various things which we have evaluated about uh, the patient and uh, he found a lot of lack in it and he said look you guys in uh, government setup you see 100 cases 200 cases but what is the use unless you evaluate one particular patient and reflect on it you may not make and you may learn anything and that was an eye opener to me so simply building on our experience will not help we will learn only from reflecting on our experience so that is the difference between a simply you no know, summarizing or reflections because of the positive time i'll skip i hope everybody knows this so this is a you know uh, corps experiential learning cycle which again everybody is familiar with first we will have an experience that says student should have an experience now he analyzes what happened and reflects on it and then makes general statements or abstract conceptualization what went wrong how best he can improve on that next time and then he puts it into an action so that is how the learning takes place so the advantages of reflection are it helps in self directed learning integration of theory and practice and develops critical thinking and improves the professional skills so coming to the last but most important part or the competency that the students should have is knowledge about our use of ict hall and colleagues termed the word digital literacy in 2014 it refers to the skills attitudes and knowledge required by the educators to support learning in a digitally rich world to be digitally literate educators must be able to utilize technology to enhance and transform classroom practices and to enrich their own professional development and identity the digital literature educator will be able to think critically about why how and when technology supplements learning and teaching i think this is a big definition but it underscores the fact that both student and educators should be familiar with this technology otherwise we will become obsolete and outdated and i think uh, that's what i think uh, professor ashwini that was also mentioning we need to embrace the change as early as possible so various uh, categories of uh, in the ict opportunities are available in medical education systems based on computer support for learning of basic medical sciences computer simulation systems for training and testing of clinical competency including virtual reality and other things systems based on computer counseling and systems based on computers for data management and quality assurance so these are all the things which has you know, progressed in the last few years and uh, as a medical education is ourselves as well as the students should be able to use these things to improve their learning so in medical education mainly they can be you know categorized into computer assisted learning virtual reality and human patient simulators among the computer learn assisted learning the most important thing is the e learning which everyone all of us are familiar in fact this is also a sort of e learning which we are doing now one of the major goals of the e learning is providing individuals comprehensive and dynamic content in real time in order to maintain the pace with the changes that are now rapidly taking place so the science is evolving or changing rapidly whatever which i had learned 5 years back Maybe may, may not be the correct one at this moment, 
new changes would have taken place. And e-learning is the best way because my professor always used to say with the new inventions, when it comes to test books, it will be almost five years after the original invention. So with the e-learning, now we have an opportunity to you know, With the, we have an opportunity to know, learn, come to know about such things immediately. So, to underscore this imp importance of this, there was a study by Cassetti and uh, Fives in 2013. They provided iPads to both teachers and students. Actually, the iPads improved teachers' presentation skills and iPad use skills and other IT skills. While the challenges were, the teachers you know, needed planning and organizing the student work and limited knowledge of teacher iPad knowledge. Whereas from the student perspective, actually there were more benefits to the students. Students, from the student perspective, the benefits were more than the disadvantages, probably because they are the modern stu day students. So naturally, you know, they will be mu much ahead of the teacher in uh, using the ICTs. Increase the student motivation, greater access to information, portable, all these things, I think a lot of advantages. They found a lot of advantages with the use of iPad in their study. So how does this ICT helps in self-directed learning? One is, of course, online teaching programs, courses. We were discussing about Swayam courses and you know, Coursera and all those things. So we have an opportunity to select what course suits our needs. So that is a sort of self-directed learning. Student teacher and student student networking with the use of internet. We have a lot of them. We are doing it through WhatsApp. This can be used for learning. For example, I have a network of you know, spine surgeons. We post some interesting cases in this network and then the discussion will happen. So that is a sort of self-directed learning. YouTube and other video based learnings have revolutionized the learning process, especially in the field of medical education. And of course, free access of medical journals. To highlight this, for example, you know, if I want to learn a part, uh, to learn a particular surgery, you know, uh, some variations of a particular surgery, I'm skilled in that surgery, but some variations have come. So, or I need to perfect my techniques. We can go to the YouTube, and then you know, a lot of opportunities or a lot of uh, videos are available. Similarly, use of WhatsApp, where actually in the networking, we can do a networking and then discuss our uh, cases and then get information. This is you no know, uh, discussion that was happening since last two days in our local orthopedic society. And uh, one of the challenging case was this uh, we, were, uh, we were discussing and there were various suggestions, including you know, how to uh, perform this surgery, how to plan the surgery. So it's a very interesting tool. Mm, so that is one. And then yes, uh, about the latest articles and journals we have PubMed. So that is another thing. And yes, even to learn the, for the student from the student perspective to learn the clinical examination, lots of videos are available in YouTube. So there are a lot of opportunities for self-directed learning with the use of uh, no, uh, ICT. Another area is uh, virtual reality like uh, advanced life support training, which is possible with this skill labs. In NFA also, we have skill labs. So that's about the use of ICT. Of course, we can speak a lot about it. But then uh, because of the paucity of time, I'll move on to the challenges. Now, the challenges in uh, self-directed learning, last few slides. So this was a study conducted by Naushin Kohan et al. published in 2017. So they have identified following themes and sub-themes like cognitive and mental barriers. These are the barriers for self-directed learning from the student perspective. The information overload is one mind wandering when they are you know, looking at a particular literature. You know, they will be you know, wandering to various uh, irrelevant uh, uh, learning material also. Communication barriers, uncertainty, ambiguity, then poor writing skills sometimes. Environmental and educational barriers like heavy workload, difficult to cope up with the stress. So these are the barriers for self-directed learning uh, from the student perspective. Challenges for teachers. Adapting to the change, to the role of facilitator or mentor. We were all no, the, accustomed to do, give big, big lectures. Everybody, no, nobody is an exception. So even my lecture is now going on. I do not know what was, what is the level of interaction. So 
but then we need to change as uh, professor ashwini that has pointed out we need to embrace the technology and we need to move to the role of facilitator and mentor it is actually a challenge for us and also understanding the ict skills is probably students will be much faster than us and we need to outsmart them in uh, understanding these techniques the one of the real problem that was highlighted by reinders and white is the learner need to have autonomy in sdl that is the most important thing over their learning experience and this happens through various changes like identifying the needs setting goals planning learning selecting resources selecting learning strategies practice monitoring progress and assessing and revising this was these are the various stages and uh, the ict should be the no 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 in their study has, they have highlighted that ict should be used to promote the development of learner autonomy but then from the teachers perspective when whenever the teachers believe that the students were at risk they were less likely to allow students opportunities to engage in autonomous self directed learning the teachers pre existing practices and beliefs also play a role in this so this is where the teachers need to understand that self directed learning is all about uh, uh, providing autonomy to the learner and we need to change and adapt this and this is a real challenge so i think uh, with this uh, i conclude my talk so these are some of the material probably do anybody who want can take a snapshot of this so with this i conclude my talk thank you thanks a lot thank you sir for that wonderful talk i now call upon the last speaker for today dr imran pasha from yelpoya dental college he has completed his bbs from yelpoya dental college and mds from the oxford dental college bangalore currently working as reader in public health dentistry yelpoya dental college bangalore he is pursuing his famer fellowship at manipal He has completed his PU FX certificate program on interprofessional education. He has also completed a basic implantology program at Yenapoya Dental College. He is the president of Yenapoya University Alumni Association and a member of Indian Dental Association Dakshin Kannada branch. Over to you, Dr. Indra. I am. Uh, am I am I audible? Yes. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'll not take much time. Uh, you know, the today's. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Abhinav Gade sir, uh, uh, the Deputy Director of uh, Centre for Health Professions Education, also the Associate Dean of Pune Medical College, also Dr. Ashwini Datta, Ashwini Datta sir, who is also the Associate Dean. and i'm really proud that uh, you know i'm making the presentation in front of my former dean uh, dr b uh, s shubhendra rao sir who has been a source of inspiration and uh, who has given a lot of opportunities for improvement uh, you know it's indeed a pleasure when you present in front of your own teacher uh, so today's topic uh, is on how how ict that is the, the information and communication facilitates implementation of the interprofessional education now everybody would be wondering what is this interprofessional education it's very simple it's like you know we have been trained to work with a team so if i give if i take the example of uh, mbbs students he will be trained in five and a half years and he will go and join a hospital where he has to work with a group of nurses a physiotherapist a lab assistant uh, ultimately he doesn't know how to communicate with them so basically it's it's all about training all these people together so the definition says uh, you know interprofessional education occurs when two or more professions uh, learn with about and from each other this is the key words ultimately the uh, beneficiaries are the patients and improve the uh, health outcomes and ultimately it leads to the effective collaboration so this is what we try to do in the interprofessional education try to bring uh, people from different uh, uh, professions together and uh, try to learn the subjects together so that ultimately they lead to a better healthcare so now coming to the icts now i'll not go into details what icts are basically uh, you know basically they are here to create communicate disseminate and manage information that is the idea of using the uh, uh, information communication technologies and this can be done using the computer uh softwares internet broadcasting technologies we can use anything web based learning uh, the very own example of our engage which is a learning management system 
and uh, the very own tool i'm right now i'm using it's also an example of the uh, information and communication technology that is the uh, and also the uh, you know in order to sum up online learning as an example has been identified as an alternative and interactive method for overcoming some of the scheduling and geographical challenges associated with facilitating interprofessional learning now if i have to take uh, medical dental nursing and physiotherapy students together they already have their pressure on the curriculum so scheduling them and putting them all together in one room it is going to be difficult so hence technology actually has played a huge role in the implementation of the interprofessional education and uh, you know with the covid coming to our help uh, definitely you know it will help uh, help us in further you know or uh, doing this uh, teaching so let me clear your doubts that the uh, ipe work does it lead to improved patient outcomes does it lead to professional satisfaction does it lead to reducing the work burden of the professionals i have picked up only three key areas what i believe you know is important from the point of view of the healthcare professionals you know i just have to quote a, a study uh, you know a, a compiled report by the institute of medicine and uh, reeves uh, et al in 2016 it says ipe can equip healthcare learners with the attitude knowledge and skills needed to work effectively in a collaborative practice so you know this is this word sums up the all the other three things what i have already asked the question the answer to all those three questions are yes definitely yes and now let's come back to the topic on how online interprofessional education facilitates there are three core areas which i have taken from uh, the study by sherry uh, it is the type types of the online ipe facilitation the experience of online ipe uh, facilitation maybe it is from the point of view of the facilitator maybe it may be from the point of view of the uh, student uh, let me discuss a few point and also the personal outcomes how ipe has led a change in the uh, the person who teaches them coming to the types of online facilitation contributions uh, in ipe now you can see here uh, there is a, a platform designed like virtual ipe which i am the member also and you can see that you know we have a lot of cases you have around nine cases with case summaries for students to go one case one by one you can assign each cases to each group of students and tell them to learn about them this is one of the ways you know through web based and uh, you know uh, to to cut the team short we also have uh, the enfi dental education unit also has prepared the e modules on the interprofessional education as a part of my fema fellowship uh, through which passive learning or asynchronous learning can be done uh, also we have uh, created uh, the content in the uh, google platform uh, in the google uh, classroom platform on interprofessional education uh, to learning these are all the various different types where uh, online education can be used and uh, you know uh, tufh also provides not many courses uh, you know the, there are the areas ipe is also one among them you can see here and you know you can ask about what is tufh tufh is a, a non profit organization supported by ecmg and fema and basically they are a non state actor for world health organization so that's about the little bit of background on types of the online uh, facilitation contribution by various means and uh, coming to the various icts uh, being used in the interprofessional education so i'll not go much into it but basically the asynchronous asynchronous discussion boards learning management systems like ours uh, video conferencing emails web conferencing multimedia video instant messaging websites uh, the previously told examples are of the websites even the mobile communications they have used they are uh, you know listed in the increasing order of the presentation so basically yes in the in the facilitation of the uh, interprofessional education there have been an increased number of tools which are being used uh you know prior to you know, now we have to analyze all these problems prior to covid situation now covid has come in and entirely changed the situation where you know it has made everybody technology friendly but you know if i have go if i go through the literature and if i you know start reading the literature everybody will be telling you know oh no it is very difficult you know I, we have articles where you know they are literally condemning the online educations so basically the experience of that is what i said the experience of online ipe facilitation uh, you know to sum up in a positive note uh, you know uh, we have found a positive relation where the students as well as the facilitators have got a positive associations but you know if i have to say uh, from the point of view of the students there have been lot of uh, crit criticism uh, on the online uh, teaching tools you know they have been telling that you know it was not beneficial for them it was not useful for them but post covid uh, the situation has changed but there are there has always been a constant effort which was made 
both uh, from the IPE facilitators as well as others, considering uh, the scheduling and the geographical uh, uh, problems. Uh, you know, to facilitate IP through the online, and we are continue to evolve uh, in this field. Uh, coming to the personal outcomes on the online IP facilitations, uh, well, what do, what should I say? Both peer facilitators as well as everybody who was involved in teaching IPE through online, you know, they change the way they behave, they practice, they talk, or they mingle, or they share the information with the other colleagues. You know, that has been a positive change. By being a facilitator, you know when they uh, when ma majority of the universities choose the facilitators, they might be from medical background, they might be from pharmacy background, they might be from dental background. You know they learn to collaborate with the medical, dental, nursing, physiotherapy. Ultimate goal is always the patient. That means to give a, a better treatment for the patient to make sure that the patient is at a safer hands. So this is what uh, the personal outcomes are. And then the personal outcomes are basically in the, uh, in the form of the experiences, whatever we have gone through already, you know, the technology problems, the connection problems, uh, you know, always uh, understanding whether my, my lectures have been listened, uh, you know, by the students or not. These are all the questions which is always there. But, you know, uh, as we are teachers, we find innovative ways of making sure that, you know, our, our students are learning from what we are teaching. You know, uh, the same methodologies has been used. Overall, to sum it up, you know, uh, I can put pre-COVID and a post-COVID era. Uh, Pre-COVID era, you know, uh, the embracing of the technology was not that great, but it, no, it was okay. They were all okay, okay side, uh, kind of thing. But post-COVID, I think uh, we will see a lot many changes, as, uh, spe especially in the field of interprofessional education. To conclude, uh, there is evidence that uh, you know, uh, ICTs are effective as uh, traditional uh, teaching methods in health sciences education. And such technologies offer opportunities for overcoming some of the logistical and geographical barriers that can inhibit effective and meaningful interprofessional education. Uh, these are my references. And uh, you know, uh, before I conclude, I would like to announce that we already have we also have an online workshop on interprofessional education and uh, practice, uh, which will soon reach all of you. This is an asynchronous and synchronous uh, way of uh, learning. And uh, we will have both international and uh, national level speakers who will be addressing on interprofessional education. This is also one of the ways of how ICT facilitates. You know, this is uh, basically a part of the faculty development program devised uh, as a part of my uh, famous fellowship. So I request uh, most of the participants who are here to join for this program. Uh, to end my talk, I have a small video presentation. I hope you will be all be able to see. To finally, to end, uh, this was a, uh, one of the best movies which I have seen, Crudes, which you know, uh, implements an idea, changing ourselves, adopting ourselves, and innovating ourselves so that you know, we use the information and com uh, communication and technology tools to our uh, better use so that we can bring in cha positive changes in the lives of the students. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Imran, for putting forth in front of us the uh, idea of IPE. Uh, any questions? Okay, so uh, we'll move ahead uh, with the next uh, part of the event. Uh, I now request Dr. Abai to take over the session. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Neha. Uh, thank you, Imran. Uh, very good presentation. So we are at the end of this uh, uh, five webinar, the, uh, the basic course. So uh, it's our honor and a pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. B. H. Sripati Rao, our uh, pro vice chancellor. Uh, sir is a great teacher, uh, administrator, and uh, 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 very good human being. Uh, in my last seven years of association with sir, I have never uh, hear no from uh, sir always a positive boost. He always used to encourage whatever academic or uh, endeavor we undertake. So uh, without uh, any uh, uh, further delay, I request uh, our uh, uh, beloved Pro Vice Chancellor, Dr. B.H. Sripati Rao, sir, to uh, address the uh, delegates. Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Abai Nirgude. Good afternoon to all my dear colleagues. I am extremely happy to participate in the valedictory function 
of this webinar seeing i mean webinar series being conducted by the center for health professional education as you all know that uh, the ugc has made it mandatory that every new faculty who joins the institution should undergo this training program on basic course in technology and rich emerging pedagogy methods so considering this the our chp department under the leadership of uh, dr rabai and his uh, team have organized this webinar series for the last uh, five weeks i'm very extremely happy i feel sorry that i was not able to participate every day otherwise i would have loved to participate in this where i believe age is not the limit you, at any age you can learn new things and as a teacher who has spent almost more, about more than 45 years in teaching i still feel that uh, we have to improve our skills and anyway, unfortunately i have retired from uh, the basic teaching but still i would like to improve my skills so my dear friends and friends i'm happy that all of you have taken part in this what is very important is not just listening and learning you have to implement it what i see is that uh, maybe for the next one or two weeks you will be very very serious in implementing it after that you just slowly forget it please don't do that all the efforts what are taken in learning should be put into practice and not only that you should make your other colleagues to learn from you and see that the uniformly the all the departments will participate so this is very very important otherwise all the efforts put forward by dr abhay and his team will go waste so please see that it is implemented i don't want to talk much at this juncture but on behalf of the nfi university i would like to profusely thank all the external speakers who have shared their knowledge not only their knowledge they taken they are valuable time out of their busy schedule so thank you one and all for that and also i would like to thank abhay and his team for taking this pain it's not a joke to you know organize such a long webinar series for the last five weeks he has organized this and uh, many more to come because i feel every individual has to undergo if there is a chance i will also come and join the next course because i would like to improve my own skill with these few words i wish everyone all the best and uh, great learning and you should implement this in your day to day practice thank you dr abai for the opportunity given thank you so much sir uh, for your uh, words of uh, appreciation and the motivation for the faculty this will go a long way thank you so much sir uh, i would like to yeah i would like to place on record my gratitude and thanks to the management the our honorable chancellor uh, pro chancellor Uh, our vice chancellor and uh, our registrar sir for support and sanction in this endeavor our uh, pro vice chancellor dr uh, raghuveer sir and dr shripati rao sir uh, all the deans of the constituent colleges i must place on record the webinar coordinators for all these five webinars starting with uh, dr ashwin <laughs> for today's webinar and dr neha uh, for the today's webinar then uh, dr uma professor uma rani from nursing uh, college vice principal Dr. Padmini, uh, uh, in charge of the physiology. Dr. Rashmi Jain, MEU coordinator, and Dr. Um, uh, Poonam Naik, and uh, uh, and uh, more, and one more person I should thank profusely is uh, Dr. Rishikesh, who is the young faculty in the Community Medicine Department. Uh, he is the one who is taking care of this continuity uh, uh, of the course, whether the assignment is submitted, assessment is done or not. So thank you, Rishikesh, for that. And, and uh, all the CHP members for their full support and the participants for their you are active participation. Uh, so thank you so much. Without the help of each and every one of you, if I forgot anybody's name, uh, uh, please forgive me. Uh, because all the resource person they have done wonderfully well. Uh, and uh, the whether in house and the external resource person, lot of work has gone behind this. So I thanks once again and I request the participants to complete the assignment and assessment. Uh, in next uh, four days time and uh, so that uh, we can uh, issue the certificates uh, uh, through the uh, from vice chancellor sir so thank you so much uh, thank you uh, dr shripati rao sir once again thank you, uh, thank you dr ashwini dat uh, and dr neha thank for today's yeah. webinar coordination uh, dr rishikesh thank you so much thank you one and all uh, ashwini sir you want to say something 